let's dive in and talk about chest tubes, specifically in pneumothorax and hemothorax. When do I abs and when do I actually have to intervene? All right. So what's the big deal with chest tubes? We're all really good at putting these in. We've done a million of them. If it helps the patient, why not? Here's the issue. So they're not without their complication. And I've taken a smattering of really awful cases that I have found in the literature. None of these are mine or anyone else's that I know. And just wanted to share some that are especially horrifying. So this is a chest tube in the liver. Um, so it's a little bit high and it can totally happen. This one through the spleen into the abdominal cavity not going to help a hemothorax or a pneumothorax and probably cause some pneumoperitoneum and hemoperitoneum. And then this one, which really blows my mind and always just makes me so uncomfortable when I look at it, is the chest tube that is in the ventricle. And so that, that got pushed a little too far. And I do love that they managed to get a CT scan of the chest tube in the ventricle. So yeah, yikes, big time yikes moment. And this can happen to you, it can happen to me, it can happen to any one of us, right? Despite our best intentions, complications happen. And in fact, they happen in about 30% of chest tubes. So they're gonna have some kind of complication. And if you're thinking, I've never had a complication with any of my chest tubes, it means it probably happened after the patient left your care and you just didn't hear about it. So it's probably happened. So the question here becomes, which pneumothoraces, which spontaneous pneumothoraces require an actual intervention? Which one can I obs and which one do I have to put the chest tube or the pigtail in? Now, a large pneumothorax such as this one, so you can see there's a really large one here and you've got the whole heart and mediastinum pushed to the other side. So that's a tension and that's bad. That's going to need intervention. I can tell you that off the top of my head. But what we really want to know is how far can we push the envelope? So how big is too big? Which ones can I obs safely? And which ones do I really need to intervene on? And this was a study that was published a couple of years ago. The QR code on the right will take you to the actual study. And the QR code on the left will take you to a write-up I did for the rebel fight of that study. And it was multi-center, it was prospective, they randomized it. And this was a non-inferiority -inferior, trial. And they were looking specifically at observation versus intervention in patients who have a large pneumothorax. So we're talking greater than 32% pneumothorax. And so the, what they were trying to figure out, the primary outcome is, would there be lung re-expansion within eight weeks? So the primary outcome, they followed these patients out for two months to see who had re-expanded and who had not. They managed to recruit a little over 300 patients and they had data available for about 250 at that eight week mark, which is pretty good for a study. And so again, this was a non-inferiority trial. And what they found was that even in a large pneumothorax, so greater than 32%, observation was non-inferior to intervention. Now, the issue with observation is some of us can't really do that in our emergency department, or we don't have the space, or we don't have the adequate nursing facility or nursing staffing to be able to staff an OBS unit that's going to be able to monitor these patients the way they need to be monitored. And so sometimes it's easier to just put the pigtail in and send the patient home or put the chest tube in if it's really big. Um, but the key point here is we now know that the old teaching of 10%, 20% pneumothorax that you can observe and anything above that needs some sort of intervention is probably out the window at this point. So it really depends on your patient, their hemodynamic stability, how they look, and your ability to obs them versus having to do that intervention. But in this particular study, it was non-inferior. So obs was non-inferior to the intervention. Which traumatic pneumothoraces require intervention? We talked about spontaneous, but are there traumatic pneumothoraces that we can avoid putting a chest tube in? And that just feels a little wrong, but let's talk about it. So how can we figure out which ones can avoid the chest tube and safely do a trial of observation like the spontaneous pneumothorax? So we're going to borrow from our critical care and pulmonary literature and look specifically at the trauma literature now. So I'm going to introduce you to the 35 millimeter rule. 
And so first, what is the 35 millimeter rule? What does it have to do with a pneumothorax? So essentially, if you measure from the parietal pleura into the visceral pleura, and you take the biggest distance that you can find on an axial CT, and hint, hint, you can ask the radiologist to do this for you. But if you like to do these kinds of things yourself, you take that largest distance and you measure it out. And if the distance is less than 35 millimeters, and so this was basically based on some older studies that they then applied to this one, if it is less than 35 millimeters, then these patients potentially are going to have a successful observation in the setting of a blunt traumatic pneumothorax. And it approaches 95% in some of these studies. So you, that, again, you take that radial distance from that outside, that parietal pleura, come bring it into that visceral pleura and you measure out. And if it's less than 35 millimeters, that particular pneumothorax may be a candidate for just observation, okay? And so this specific, this specific study looked at both blunt and penetrating then trauma patients. And it was a retrospective study, close to 300 patients that they were able to enroll. And it was, they excluded patients who had hemothorax or who needed positive pressure ventilation, so patients who were intubated. And of the 200 and 89, 90 patients that they were able to enroll, 272 of them had a pneumothorax that was less than 35 millimeters. And so they opted to actually just go ahead and observe these patients. And what they found was, meaning no chest tube was placed, 91% of those patients never ended up needing a chest tube. 91% of the patients never ended up needing a chest tube. These are patients that we would have automatically thrown a tube. And 9% or about 25 of the patients got a chest tube eventually, though it wasn't really clear why in about half of them. In the half that we actually have data about that we know why they ended up getting the chest tube, the reason was either the pneumothorax was expanding, so it was getting larger, or the patient developed a hemothorax. And so when you tease out blunt versus trauma, the rates were, the failure rates were identical. So it really didn't even matter. And so this is an amazing study. If you really think about the number of chest tubes that we put in trauma for a pneumothorax, and if we can use this cutoff of 35, that would be amazing. Another study very recently, so published February of this year, again, looking at this 35 millimeter rule, to figure out, is this safe and can we use this adequately? And what this was, again, a retrospective study, adult trauma patients who had a pneumothorax identified on the CT and they were able to measure out the 35 millimeters. And what they did was they looked at the patient population a year before implementation of that guideline and then a year after to take a look at failure rates and mortality. And what they found was there was really no difference in failure rates in the observation group, okay, so that's a big deal, in terms of hospital length of stay, so whether you're getting observed or you end up getting some sort of intervention, chest tube or pigtail, no difference. In terms of ICU length of stay, there was no difference. In terms of complications, no difference. And then mortality, so the big one, no difference between just pure observation versus putting in a chest tube. And so this really tells it, at least to me, that even in a traumatic pneumothorax, I can use that 35 millimeter guideline. And if it's less than that, I'm going to opt to OBS the patient and not put that chest tube in. The other thing I will tell you is that we also get transfers from other hospitals that are traumas. And if you're at a facility where you don't have a trauma center and you transfer these patients, if you have that CT and you know that pneumothorax, you've followed that 35 millimeter rule, if you relay that to your trauma surgeons, most of the time they're going to tell you, you don't need to put that chest tube in, especially if the patient is hemodynamically stable. So worth having a conversation and potentially just continuing the OBS in the other hospital. Now, let's talk about traumatic hemothorax. Now, which traumatic hemothoraces require intervention? And this one's a little more complicated. So 
20% complication rate associated with chest tube and hemothorax, okay? ATLS has taught us a, for a long time that hemothorax always needs a chest tube, right? And so we all learned this was drummed into our head. This was a retrospective study looking at the safety of observation in traumatic hemothorax and to identify predictors of failure. And what they found was there's this 300 milliliter rule. And what is this 300 milliliter rule? Basically, you can ask your radiologist to do this for you as well. On a CT, they have a way of being able to measure out what the volume of a hemothorax is going to be. And if you can stay below that 300 milliliter rule, so if that 300 milliliter cutoff, the volume of that hemothorax is less than that, this patient is potentially going to benefit from pure observation. So in this particular study by Dimitri, 340 patients with a hemothorax, uh, the vast majority of them were blunt trauma and 184 of them. So about half of them were initially observed versus the other half that got an early thoracostomy tube or chest tube. 66% of the patients were successfully observed and never ended up needing a chest tube. So that's a big deal. So not only now in traumatic pneumothorax, 35 millimeter rule, traumatic hemothorax, 300 milliliter rule, potentially we can, we can just get away with observation. What are predictors of failure in a traumatic hemothorax for the observation period? So patients who were, there were four independent predictors, patients who were older, patients who had more days on the ventilator. If the hemothorax, again, was greater than 300 mLs, which is why we're trying to stay below that threshold. And if the patient had a concurrent pneumothorax, those were predictors of failure for observation of a traumatic hemothorax. Now, what were the complications that they saw with chest tube placement? So some of the stuff that we tend to see. So empyema, that stinks longer length of stay in the hospital in patients who had a chest tube. And then patients who had a chest tube tended to get discharged to rehab rather than being able to get discharged home more frequently than the patients who were simply observed. So what's the takeaway here? In your hemodynamically stable patients who have a pneumothorax that is less than 35 millimeters or a hemothorax that is less than 300 milliliters, and we're talking about traumatic, these patients can be safely observed.